are ready for fall. Anybody ready for fall? Yes, you are the spiritual people in this room. Fall is the time for leaves changing, for roasting s'mores on fire pits, right? Because it's cold enough, you guys to get around a fire. It's for like camping. It's, it's for all those great times where you can just get, oh, and did I mention something starts back in the fall? What? What was it? Christmas decorations. Christmas decorations. And football. You're all right. Yes. Football. God bless America. We're all tied. Amen. Football. That hallowed sport that if we're not careful can become an idol. But we're spiritual, so we don't let that happen. Football. I don't talk about it a whole lot in the pulpit. I mean, I, I do, but I, but I don't. What I have never really shared publicly, if you're a close friend, you know this, but I have a famous uncle, a great uncle, who played for Bear Bryant. It began my love for Alabama. It was Leroy Jordan, number 50 for Bama, 55 for his pro team. And he was, he was one of the star linebackers for Bear Bryant. Actually went on to win a national championship with him. There's his uh, high tops, whatever, what do you call it, upper deck uh, baseball card. And Bear Bryant said, if this guy had an enemy near him in bounds, he would get him. He wasn't huge. He was big. He was 6'1", 225 pounds. He's still with us. And then in 1963, after winning a national championship, or maybe two with Bear Bryant, he was drafted the number one pick by the Dallas Cowboys. And he went on to have an incredible career. 14 seasons. Here he is taking down Franco Harris, having an awesome, awesome game. He went on to win a Super Bowl, play in three of them, and go to five All-Pro Bowls and be a three-time all-star. It was incredible. He would go on, actually, to be on the cover of Sports Illustrated. It's pretty cool. I mean, not, not many people could say that. Now, you get to see his Super Bowl ring and all these great things. And then when he finally retired, after 14 incredible seasons with the Dallas Cowboys playing for Tom Landry, they retired and put his name on the ring of fame between Roger Staubach and Tom Landry. That's pretty cool. So imagine my excitement. And my joy, when I get a call from the Jordans and says, little nephew, how would you like to come down to Alabama and go to Alabama Stadium with us and experience a real Alabama football game this November? I said, no, I'm not interested. <laughs> no. Who wants to? Yes! Are you kidding? Absolutely. Because we love football. And we can go all out. At football, And I've seen some of you. I've seen some of you. Maybe you didn't know you were on camera or something. Maybe you didn't know I was at the game. But I've seen it. We have photos. You go crazy because we can cheer and scream and be all excited about football. We come on Sunday, it's a little bit more <laughs> spiritual. But we get to have no problem dressing up and doing crazy things like this. Here's, here's some fans. There's Doug Bell on the left. He's a big Duke fan. There's Roy on the right. People have no trouble painting their faces and wearing their favorite fan colors on their sleeves, or in this case, literally on their backs. Yeah. Yeah, I went there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we're, we won't leave that up. A, a, a recent church member posted this just recently, and I thought it was fantastic. You should be as excited about church as about the Super Bowl. So when your pastor makes a good point today, you should pour Gatorade over his head. Maybe not that, but maybe that's the excitement level that God is kind of getting at in this psalm we're going to look at today. Psalm 100 is so full of passion and joy and excitement. It is one of the most incredible and famous psalms in all of the Bible. And it starts with how God wants to be worshipped, not necessarily by being Gatorated, but then it moves to why he wants to be worshipped. And it's really powerful. It's like five short verses. So go ahead and open your Bibles, pull up your favorite Bible app, Psalm 100. I'm going to read from the NIV today. And while you pull that up, let me welcome our online campus. Great to have you with us each and every week. If you can't be here live, that's the next best thing. We hope you visit us sometime. First time guest, a special welcome to you. Psalm 100. Let me set the context here for what we're about to read. A lot of Bible scholars believe this was the actual psalm that was sung by the early worshipers as they approached the temple. In fact, there were six psalms that were sung. And as they got closer and their feet came close to going into the temple steps, into the temple proper, it is said that this psalm we're about to read is the actual one that they burst into shouting and singing. 
And that brings us to our very first word. Look at this verse with me. It says, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It's he who made us, and we're his. We're his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. We just did that. For the Lord is what? Good. And his love endures for a couple weeks. Forever. His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Notice how that psalm starts. What's that first word? I did not hear that. What's that first word? Okay, seven of you. Awesome. One more time. What is that first word? Shout. Yes, it's incredible. That is what it is. Notice that it's a command. Notice that it doesn't look like a suggestion. If you're happy, you might want to shout. It's not like that. He's saying worship. Worship is not passive. We get all excited about football, myself included. But we come to church, we're like, yeah, it's okay. We prepare for football. Some of us do crazy stuff, man, shaving our bodies and putting on makeup and doing all kinds of stuff. But do we do the same thing for our worship times together? Worship isn't supposed to be a spectator sport. We're not supposed to let others do it, pay these, you know, fantastic musicians and, and you know, we go to these big churches and there's big laser lights and fog machines and Cirque du Soleil dancers spinning on hula hoops and all kinds of crazy stuff. And I'm just like, what have we made worship? I'm so grateful for what we have. But we're not supposed to just watch it. And, and like applaud it lightly, like that, that was fantastic. What a fabulous song. 9.5, <laughs> 9 9.7, ooh, I really, that was my favorite song. 9.9 .9 or 2.6, because there's always that one Russian judge, you know what I'm talking about? That's, uh, they're always colluding and doing, th okay, all right, all right. So here, here we have Psalm 100 saying straight out of the gate, shout to the Lord, worship him, do it joyfully, and know that he is God. He is the one who made us. It says no. Don't miss that. That's an easy word to read and forget. It doesn't say wonder if you were created specially. It doesn't say hope or guess or pray or think about. It says know that he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. Verse 3 says we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So in these next 24 hours, why do 2 billion worshipers come together and worship the Lord. Why worship the Lord? Think about that. The first answer is because he is God. It shows us right there in the first opening passage. God wants us to worship him every day, absolutely. But there is something special about Sunday. There is something special when we come to worship, when we gather, because this is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. This is the day Christians celebrate the resurrection of the Lord. His resurrection changed everything. He's, he's the only God with a real capital G that's not in the grave. His name's not Vishnu. It's not Krishna. It's not Allah. It's not Buddha. You can all go and check out their graves, and they're still there. Their bones are there. It's a memorial. But not Jesus. Not Yeshua. And in this passage, the Hebrew word they use is Yahweh. So reverent, they didn't even put the vowels in. They just abbreviated because they didn't want to say it. The Lord literally translated here as Yahweh. He is God. Yahweh is the one who showed up in a burning bush to Moses. Yahweh is the one who showed up in a towering tornado of fire at night and cloud by day to lead Israel. He's the one that showed up and shut the lion's mouths in the den. He's the one that showed up and fed manna to the children of Israel and set down fire on Mount Carmel. Yahweh is the Lord. The psalmist says the Lord is God. It's not to be debated not to be questioned. I love it. He doesn't even assume anything. He just says, this is the truth. Boom. Deal with it. Yahweh is the Lord, and the Lord is God. We worship him because he's God. Can it get any more obvious than that? Let's bring it down to modern day things that we can relate to. Toy Story. I love Toy Story because there's little green aliens, and they worship, what is it? The claw. How many have seen it? I love it. The claw. And anytime the claw does this little movement, they look up, it's about to move. Somebody's going to be chosen. And when they do, the claw comes down and it grabs somebody and goes, ooh, he's been chosen. And they worship it because he's the claw. Well, they worship the claw because he's the claw. We worship God because he's God. 
We worship God because he is the only one worthy of worship, worthy of getting up early in the morning, yes, worthy of fighting rain or the threat of rain, worthy of being the one that, that say, you know what, I'm going to put on nice, modest clothes and show up. He's worth going before all of my priorities. That I have all these opportunities, all these distractions. He is the one. When you chose to be here today, you told the world what your highest priority was. Well done. <laughs> Congrats. A little pat on the back. You don't think your neighbors notice when your family clampers in that little family truckster, metallic pea green, and heads off to church? They know, somebody knows what I'm talking about. They notice, just like they notice when our cars sit in the driveway. They know, you notice. Don't you notice when your friends are out late Saturday night and they're partying in the backyard and you're like, oh my goodness, it's two in the morning. How fun can cornhole be? <laughs> Beanbag, great, go inside. It is, so, it is so amazing. I mean, we notice things. We're kidding ourselves if we think we're, we're, we're not being watched. Whether we like it or not, whether we know it or not, we make a statement. Remember what the very first commandment says. This is so, so powerful. The scripture says, I'm the Lord your God, and you shall have no other gods before me. And I like that it uses the little g. Because it's talking about an idol, a false god. You say, Pastor, man, we don't have false gods today. Not one of us, I guarantee. Not one of us has a little gold statue hidden in our hutch. Is anyone? Oh, uh, none of us do that. But do we have... We have other idols. See, this is telling us, when you set your priorities straight, God is God. We're to shout to the Lord, not at him. Shout to him and show him and give him worthy and majesty. No other gods before him. Not Sunday morning brunch and sleeping in. Not shopping. Not piddling in the yard, doing your little yard work that could wait. Not Sunday morning softball. Not Sunday morning NFL football, because that's what your DVR is for. It'll wait. We worship on Sundays. We worship on the weekends because the Lord asked us to. And he is God. Amen? That was pretty weak. I'll move on. The psalmist then says, we worship God because he made us. He made you. Did you know that? He made you. Here's a newsflash. You're not a cosmic accident. You weren't a result of a couple atoms going around, bouncing into each other, becoming helium and then hydrogen and pff, sprouting and then shaving and standing upright and going, surprise, here we are. You were made with a divine purpose. Hear me, you are not an accident. You are special. You have value. You're the only one on the planet created with a soul that will be everlasting. Think about that. You are special. You were made. You're not supposed to keep quiet about this. You are precious in his sight. Scripture says you have value because you were knit together in your mother's womb. Before the days were, he saw you. He knew you. You are special. You have divine purpose. The next reason we worship the Lord is found in the next passage. Because we are his people. The song goes on to say, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. We're his peeps. <laughs> we're his sheeps. How about that, right? We're his people. We're his sheeple, the sheep of his pasture. 900 million people worship Krishna this weekend. One billion worship Allah. But two billion, including us, worship Yahweh, Elohim. The one true God. The only one that you can visit and can't find his body. The only one, by the way, who didn't say, you will die for me, I am your God. But the one who came and says, no, 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 I will die for you, for I am your God. No other faith dares claim that. You don't think you're special? You don't think this psalm is trying to say something? Yahweh is worthy of worship. We come together because he's the only one that sent his son. We're his sheep, we're his people, and we worship him. Look at verse 5. It tells us we also worship him because he is good. Woo! Let's park here for a second. Do we believe this? Well, most of us believe this when things are going good. But the rubber meets the road when things aren't so good. When that phone call comes you didn't want, right? When that test result comes back. We had a dear pastor late last night on his deathbed, 80-something years old. We prayed, many pray. He's home doing great right now this morning, you know? God chose to give him a little more life. 
What about those days when God chooses not to? When he has a different plan that's different than what I personally wanted? Is God still good then? Job was asked this question. This is a powerful question. The psalmist actually touches on this. If you're in a place where God doesn't seem so good today, you're not alone. I get it. I've had days like that. God, I know you're good, and I'm going to praise you because it is the right thing to do. But if I'm being honest with you, Lord, I feel anything but good, and I feel anything but goodness coming from you. Have you been there? The psalmist has. And he would remind us, God gave you life today. Not the other people. He gave you life today. For whatever reason, he chose to continue to squeeze that heart muscle in your chest and keep it pumping. Can you do that? Can you make it stop or start? He chose to give us air to breathe today. Air is in your lungs today for a reason. He chose to put food on the table for every one of us today. He chose to put things that we can drink, oceans and beaches to swim in, mountains to climb, fire pits to be around, s'mores, football. Okay, sorry, I got carried away. It's not in there. But he chose to give us plentiful clothes in our closet and a roof over our head and friends sitting beside you who genuinely care, people to enjoy and walk through life together with. But beyond all that God does, beyond his hand, it's about his face. Beyond what he does and provides, God deserves to be worshipped because he's good. He is God and he is good. Whether my circumstance agrees with that or not, it doesn't change the truth. When your kid disobeys and you really don't like them in that moment, do you still love them? Absolutely nothing changes that. You may not feel good, but there's nothing that's going to change that. When my son or my daughter does something that just, why? What are you doing? Do I pack their suitcases? <laughs> See, uh, you're out. Man, <laughs> loser. No. <laughs> Nothing changes my relationship with them. So if God is good and God wants to be worshipped and we see that we're supposed to do that, the obvious next question for us today is, how does God want to be worshipped? And the psalm reveals that. In fact, verse 1 talks very clearly. He says, God wants to be worshipped, and that very first word is shout, right? Look closely at your translation. Make sure you don't have the one that says, whisper to the Lord, all the earth. Because it's not there. Whisper to the Lord. It says shout. Clearly, he doesn't mind being worshipped loudly and wholeheartedly. That's a lesson for us. Don't miss this. Some people, especially in our culture today, will say, you need to back down on your Christian faith. You're just a little too fanatical. Oh, oh if I could just be called a fanatic for Jesus. Oh, if my life lived in such a way that people go, man, there's something different about you. You are a freak. I'm like, bring it. <laughs> I'm, I will be happy to wave the freak flag for the Lord. <laughs> I am happy to do that. If I live in such a way that I stand out and people say, what, what is your deal? You're like that Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, really? <laughs> Thank you. What a compliment. This is so incredible. He says, worship the Lord. It's not supposed to be. Pastor, you're getting carried away. Your faith is a, a private thing. Well, not according to the one who made me. <laughs> he says he doesn't want us to be private about it. He says, shout to the Lord, not whisper. He doesn't want us to always be quiet. Are there times to be reverent and, and calm? And, and, and Absolutely. And sing passionate, quiet, intimate songs to the Lord? Totally. It's one of my favorite styles of worship. But it's not the only way. God's a God of variety. And here he says shout. That is apparently a very proper value. In fact, the volume in Psalm 29 is even more off the chart. And if you were awake last night, you heard it. It says this, the God of glory thunders. Anybody hear that last night? That thunder and stuff? Woo! Man, that's power. I love it. Notice it doesn't say quiet thunder. <laughs> I love that. There's no such thing as quiet, silent thunder. It sounds like a bad pro wrestler name, you know? <laughs> Let's welcome to the ring, silent thunder. That's just weird. The God of glory thunders. When Jesus entered to, into Jerusalem riding on a donkey, the people were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, woo! And they're throwing their cloaks before him and palms and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. And guess, guess who was the ones who were mad? Pharisees, the religious leaders, the, the prim and proper ones who speak in British accents. 
And they came up and they said, Rabbi, rebuke your disciples. Tell them to be quiet. And Jesus said, nay, nay, chap. If I tell them to be quiet, these very rocks will shout. What? Jesus apparently knows it's okay. It's okay for you to be expressive sometimes. Not to where you call attention to yourself. Not to where you're demonstrative here and you're trying to look at me. It's not about that. But it's okay to sing loud. It's okay to worship alone in your house and sing loud. It's okay to crank something up in your car and sing to him and let the world. In fact, here's your challenge. This is a little early for your challenge. When you leave this place, if you choose to accept this mission, Crank up some worship music on your way out of here. Crank it, dial it up, 106.7, 107.7, or if you're old school and, and you got a cassette like I do, whee-hoo, put in some striper, something. You get extra points if you have a striper cassette, by the way. Put in something. If you don't have Christian music, well, that says something right there, doesn't it? Get some. What do you feed in your mind? And crank it up. If you got kids in the back seat, they're going to hate it. Do it louder. Sing louder than them. Here's what's going to happen. They're going to think you are nuts, and the world's going to know you serve a God. And these kids are going to remember it the rest of their lives. You remember that day mom and dad got in the car and cranked up some of their, woo, no, shout to the Lord. Man, they can't sing at all. But I think they love God. Man, what a testimony. The God of glory thunders. The second thing we see in these verses is that we're supposed to worship God through service. Wow, well, that's pretty wild because my translation says worship the Lord with gladness, but some translations say serve the Lord with gladness. You know why? Because the Hebrew language is so powerful. They use seven different words for worship. The one used here is abad. Abad literally means to work, to serve, as if you were tilling the ground, hard work. He's saying worship, serve the Lord with gladness. Notice how active that definition is. That is so powerful. So let me ask, how you doing with that? How's your service meter? You don't have to live very long before you realize there are givers in this world and there are takers. Lord, help us to not be the takers, to where we only come and sit and soak and we go about our way. We should be known by being radically generous with our time, with our talents, with our treasure. I shared this my very first sermon years ago. It kills me that if you go to a restaurant and you talk to servers, they fight to not have to serve the Sunday after church crowd. You know why? We asked them, man, I wish I hadn't. (laughs) Can I ask you something? How do do people like, it's obvious I went to church and you you know, you say this, You really want to know? Yeah, tell us. (laughs) She said, we we fight to not have to serve this crowd because you're the most demanding of anyone we serve. And you're also the chintziest and the cheapest of tippers. Man. You know what? If we loved loudly and we lived in such a way that we serve with gladness, they would be fighting to want to serve us. Those Christians, the Christians are coming? Are you kidding? Sign me, put me in, coach. I'll come. They so love people. They, they're radical and they're, they're none of this 10%, 15%. Man, they, this one person tipped me 100 bucks. Oh, and then they invited me to church, too, which is cool because they tipped me 100 bucks. I'll go. You know what's horrible? When you hear the stories about the folded $20 bill and the person gets excited when they're clearing your table and you've gone and you open it up and it's a fake 20 and it says, Jesus loves you. Oh, my goodness. What do you think that says about the Lord? Well, your Jesus is very cheap. Think about that. People are watching us. It's not just when the car leaves. It's when our car pulls in to O'Charlie's and how we conduct ourselves and the things we say as they come to our table. Man, we're supposed to be reflecting love. We're supposed to have a spirit of joy and worship him and serve him with gladness and come before him with joyful sin. We got to see this service in, in up close and personal this past week. Marin and I got to go to a prison ministry that focuses on Christian books and Bibles and uh, getting Bible studies into prisons. And we got to go to this. This guy right here is named Armando. And if you can look close, you'll see push pins all over. This is where the ministry is in a prison. Every time you see a push, I didn't even know there are that many prisons. And we got to talk with Armando. Man, his eyes lit up. He couldn't believe 
We as a church, by the way, donated 1,247 books to this ministry. And he was blown away. There's some pictures of the Bibles that are being sent. And there's a picture of the teams of volunteers who come and stock them. And I said, Armando, tell me about this. What happens after we donate? He says, you won't believe it. Every book, every single book that you drop to us that we get into a prison, they're so hungry, it touches 14 lives. 14 lives. Because they put it on a cart and they roll it around. Anybody need one? And we reach through the bars and we're like, I want that one. Have, have you got, hey, trade that one with Jose across the street because I want that one. Hey, Matt's over here. Would you give him that one? And, and I want to say, hey, you need this one. And he says, we fight for these Christian books. He says, here's what's happening. People are getting saved left and right because of this new ministry. And you know what? I was saved because of this ministry. I'm like, wow, that's awesome. He says, you won't see this on the fake news. There's a revival breaking out in prisons. And we worship for hours. And the warden lets it go on. You know why? Because we're changed. Then he pulled out a picture of his old prison ID. And he says, Pastor Matt, you don't know me, but I was a nasty person. I was a bad person. In fact, I was so dangerous, they branded me this. And he held it up and it said, offender. On his ID for the prison. He says, look at my eyes. Look at my eyes. I'm like, I don't have to. Look at my eyes. I will look at your eyes. And I looked at his eyes. And he said, they're dead, aren't they? There's no life in them because I didn't know Jesus. But once I started reading these books, and I said, what is this man who can forgive sins and give second chances? And I came to know the Savior. Look at my eyes now. And you could see him. There's another picture of him here, I think. Put it back up. He's so full of life, so full of joy. He says, there's a revival breaking out, and I'm so excited, and I couldn't wait to start serving this ministry. And I said, Armando, tell me something. Can our church partner with you? And he said, we would love it. I said, you are so fired up. I can't wait. I want you to come speak to our youth. I want you to come talk in our church. He goes, man, I'm happy to. I'm fired up. I said, how long have you been doing this ministry, Armando? And he said, three days. (laughs) Three days? Well, good night. Where were you before that? He says, oh, I didn't tell you. I got out of prison last Friday. Where was your prison? Texas. Maximum security. And I came straight here. Three days. And he was already plugged in working, by the way, for free. He's working there for free. Think about that. He is so passionate. He went on to this part of verse 2. He says, worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. He went on to tell me how the prisoners worship with gladness. He said they are so uninhibited. They couldn't care less what their buddy thinks of them when they are in the presence of Yahweh. What a lesson for us. Isn't that inspiring to anybody? I mean, maybe a little spanking, but isn't that also inspiring? It is to me. It is so, so powerful. So when you think about this, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his course with praise. I want to leave you with some critical steps because something happened before Armando could worship like that. Something happens before we enter his gates. And it's a very simple word, and it's preparation. So how do you prepare your heart for your worship times? The first thing Psalms is telling us here is come ready and come expecting. Come hungry. So let me ask, how you doing with that? How you doing with that? When we don't prepare, when we don't think much about our times together, I mean, we're out late. Here's, here's, what, it's, here's what your Saturday night looks like, because I've been there. People are out, you're having a great time, you're playing cornhole till 2 in the morning, which whatever, if that's your game, okay, no judgment here, it's a little weird, but maybe a little judgment. And they're throwing the cornhole, and your friends are out, and they're, you're out late, and you're partying or whatever, you're seeing midnight movies or something, unless it's Star Wars, it's probably a sin. And then you try to come in here, and you're cranky, and you're tired, and that alarm clock goes off, and you're resenting it. it you can nod, it's okay, I've been, I've resented my alarm clock too. The little snooze button on your iPhone, there's like a divot where that thing is on my phone. I've hit it so much. Here's what happens. Trust me, I know how this goes. You, the, when you don't prepare and you're fighting it the next morning, if you show up, you are cranky. I, I, we hear these conversations even in our house. You can hear Amy's sweet, gentle voice being the only reasonable one. <laughs> Sweeties, you have to get up. We've got to go. You got to, I don't want to get up. I just want to sleep. Go away. You've got to get up. It's time for church. I don't want to go. I want to sleep. Besides, no one even likes me there anyway. Sweetie, you're the pastor. (laughs) You have got to go. Some of you will get that later. (laughs) This is how it is. I get it. I get it. 
For some of us as parents, Sunday morning can feel like you are running a gauntlet, and there are people lined up to beat you with clubs and sticks. It may feel about as impossible as hurting a group of cats. I get it. You can't do it. Oh, wait, never mind. Apparently it is doable. It's not so difficult after all. But you may feel like hurting cats without this guy's skill level, where you're like, no, what are you doing? Your daughter, I can't put my dress on. I don't know where this is. It's dirty. I want to... Now she's mad at you because you've got to wash it. And she's gonna, you're not going to have time to dry it because you know you're not going to do it. She's gonna, it's going to be sopping wet. She's going to be pulling on it. And your kid's upset because he can't find his shoes. And he's trying to convince you desperately that you've never bought him shoes. <laughs> I don't have any shoes. You have shoes. I've never had shoes. You're eight. You have shoes. I don't have any shoes. They're, they're in the backyard. Why are they in the backyard? And then you get in a fight. He's like, I'm hungry. I'm starving. We were getting to the van. Where's my cereal? I don't know. I spilt it. Marin's eating it. I don't know what's going on. And everybody's fighting. And it's horrible. And you get in the, we're going to get in the car. We're going to worship God. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. We're going to have fun. And you get to that front door, and you feel anything but entering his gates with thanksgiving. You're just praying you don't run into the pastor. How you doing? <laughs> <Cha> Boom. <laughs> right? Throat punch the pastor. I get it. I get it. I've been there. It's one of those things. We all deal with it. So if that's you, might I humbly suggest a better way? It's called preparation. When the Old Testament high priests would go to worship God, they would prepare. This is the high priest. This is not just average Joe. This is the high priest. He would prepare himself so much that he would take Five ceremonial baths in a mikvah. Full immersions, resulting in four clean changes of clothing. That's before he would even start to worship. Then as he would ascend the steps and come closer, his heart would start to race because he's wondering, have I really done all I can to prepare before I worship a holy God? And when he goes into the, the holy place, and then he knows that the holy of holies is right behind that thick veil, he grabs incense because he knows if he's allowed to go in there just this one day of year on Yom Kippur, he goes in, he's going to see this box. And the lid is called the mercy seat, or more correctly, the kaporet. The Hebrew word where we get the word kippur, as in Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, the atonement seat, the mercy seat. And he knows that he's going to bring incense. He lights a candle and has the smoke coming up to hide the glory of God because he can't even gaze into it. And he's in there, and he's, he's worshiping. And after he sprinkles sacrificial blood on the atonement seat, just praying he's not one of the high priests that is struck dead because of God's holiness. Then, and only then, does he begin to offer prayers for Israel. Because he's come and he has prepared. If the high priest goes through that level of preparation to go in God's presence, maybe it's not too much to ask for us to do a wee bit of preparation. So how are you doing with that? How was your preparation level today? Was it like what I described? And I won't say my house, but a house possibly like mine. Or was it like the high priest? How would you prepare for next Sunday? Here's your challenge. What if you showed God he was important? By Saturday night, clearing your calendar as the sun neared its setting, and you said, we're going to go to bed as a family at a decent hour. We're going to arrange our schedules so that we get a full night's sleep and we are coming rested to worship because it's that important. And what if, to save stress and time, what if you had every single member pick out their clothes and have their outfits laying out before they even go to bed? We do this. It saves a lot of stress. It saves me being convinced I've never bought shoes for my now nine-year-old son. We have them laid out. Did we? Last night, did we not? I said, y'all make sure you got your clothes laid out. I knew I was talking about it tomorrow. <laughs> it saves us so much stress. And what if, this is crazy, what if to save even more stress, you set the breakfast table Saturday night. You get the cereal boxes out. You set the bowls out, the, bowl, the, the spoons, whatever it is, or your Cheetos, or whatever it is you eat for breakfast. And you have it out. What if, how crazy is this? What if you let the kids do that as their act of service to mom and dad, teach them the importance of worship. What if that's their thing? What if that's their privilege? Say, why do we do this? You know why we're doing this? Because <laughs> we're going to worship God with our whole heart. And nothing is more important than that. We are taking it back from the devil. We are saying, no more will your distractions rob us of our highest priority of worshiping Yahweh.
And so we're going to take measures to do that. What if you're really crazy and to actually minimize stress? Oh, you left home 15 minutes earlier. So that when the baby pukes on the way here, it doesn't destroy your whole day. Or she does a giant boom boom in the diaper. <laughs> you have a chance to get that dealt with before you hand it off. And then you could come in and you could sit here. What, what, if the, what if you don't even have kids? What if you came 15 minutes early here and sat down and just began to worship because the music's already played? And you read your bulletin because there's news in there. And you actually read the screens because there's news on the screens. And it tells you there's a lock-in. And it tells you there are baptisms coming up next Sunday. And it tells you these things. And you come, here's, here's this is so radical. On the front of your bulletin, I put the scripture of what we're studying today. I do it every week. <laughs> what if you got here 15 minutes earlier and you saw it and opened it up and allowed God to begin to speak to you and you read it ahead of time? It's there. These things matter. What if you showed up and you didn't wait for the second song to arrive? These things matter. It's all about priorities. You do what you want to do. You're not late for your job interview. <laughs> well, I hope you're not. <laughs> I can tell you how it went if you were. <laughs> <laughs> you're not late for your vacation departure time. We, we prepare for that all week. Some of you, I know, you leave on Friday, you got your suitcase open on Monday. Like, I need that. Mm -mm. I need that. I need, this is a girl, by the way. I need that. I need that. We put that much preparation into it. But seriously, guys, do we do any preparation for coming to worship God? Do we? This is so crazy. A little advanced planning will make your worship experience so much more joyful. Then, as you arrive here prepared, start with Thanksgiving. This is so powerful. Start with Thanksgiving. The early church, that's what they did. They wouldn't dare show up into God's presence and ask for things first. Lord, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. That's one of the reasons we put the offering right up front. You know that? It's biblical. Come into his courts with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. We come. And then after we've given our worship and we've sung to him for 15, 20 minutes or whatever God leads us to do, and after we've worshiped him through his spoken word and we've heard a message, then and only then do we come and we have the appropriate time of asking him for the petitions of our heart where we come and we pray. The highlight of our day where we can come now and say, Lord, we've worshiped you. Will you help me with this? I need help here. I need this. Will you, will you meet me here in this place? And then, and only then, will we leave changed. Let me ask, do you leave changed? Because this is where it gets so good. I love this. Here's your truth grenade, by the way. I love this because... Madeline Banks quoted, quoted a truth bomb this week, and it just absolutely made, made my day that these teenagers are getting it and listening. It's so cool. See if you can figure out where I'm going with this, okay? Go ahead and hold your heads, because they're about to explode. When the people of the land come before the Lord at the appointed festivals, whoever enters by the north gate to worship is to go out the south gate. Whew, this is so good. Whoever enters by the south gate is to go out the north gate. No one is to return through the gate by which they entered. Why would God say that? Why? Doesn't God know we parked our camel out the door I came in? My donkey's out that. Why do I got to go out this? Biblical scholars who have studied this have said, is it possible that God is trying to communicate to us that nobody ought to leave worship the way they came in. Everybody ought to leave God's presence changed. Everybody ought to leave changed. If we didn't, I wonder what happened in our life that we didn't encounter God's holiness. Because when you get in the presence of a holy God, you are not left the same. It can't happen. Look at Moses. Man, his face glowed so brightly, he had to hide it from people. Think about that. When you get in God's presence, everybody ought to leave. If you came in here today mildly interested in Jesus, you should leave fully interested in Jesus. If you came in today and you're mildly committed to your marriage, 
And I want you to leave today totally committed to your marriage. And if you came today not knowing God as a personal Savior and you don't know, man, I pray that you will know him today as Redeemer and Savior, friend, Lord. So, let me ask you, do you leave changed? Will you take these challenges to prepare for worship? Psalm 100 lays out such a beautiful and brutal path for us. Everybody ought to leave changed. Let's pray about it. Bow with me. God, I thank you for the truth of your word again, that it is so alive, sharper than a two-edged sword. Lord, I thank you for speaking to me all week long in the privacy of, of the office where I can study your word and have it slice me open before I stand here. And I thank you that uh, you didn't leave us as orphans, but you became our Abba Father for those who have accepted you as Father and accepted your Son and the forgiveness he offers. Thank you, Lord, for suffering on the cross, for dying for our sin, for being the way and the only way to know the Father. You are good. Lord, even when I forget you are good, you are still good. Nothing changes that. And I thank you for the privilege to know you as our Abba Father. Meet with us in this moment, Lord. Meet the needs of your church. We bow before you now in Jesus' name. Amen.